And in particular, this is data uh, done. It's, it's rather old now, but this is, is a very large data set done, uh, conducted by a study at the, at the Harvard School of Public Health. Okay, and this is their college alcohol study. So what they did is they sent out uh, to a representative sample across the nation different students and just had them report uh, a number of things about drinks consumed. Okay? And there's an awful lot of data in this study, and this is actually part of a longitudinal study that they did. We're going to look at the data they reported here in a study in 1993. Okay? And I know there's a lot of data here. If you're interested in taking a look at it, you can, of course, pause and take a look at the slide. All students are shown at the top, and then it's broken down by gender, women and men, subsequently. They were also interested in examining uh, uh, not only the frequency of binge drinking on college campuses, but also looking at the total number of drinks and a number of other characteristics that were based on whether or not people were uh, binge drinkers or frequent binge drinkers uh, or, or infrequent binge drinkers as well. So a, a pretty massive data set they have. What we're going to be interested in is just to you know, illustrate some examples. One set of um, of values here, that's going to be take a look at all students, the infrequent binge drinkers. Okay? And what we see here is that this is, is over 4,000 students that are in this sample. So we're going to assume, even though this isn't the entire population of college students on campus, we're going to assume that this, this is uh, essentially the population for our purposes here. Right? And so what we can see is how many drinks they've consumed each week. If we continue again with just the infrequent binge drinkers across both genders, Okay, so overall the third row of data here that we're looking at. Then we can see the mean and standard deviation are 4.8 drinks in a given week and 4.3 drinks as the standard deviation respectively. Well, the mean and standard deviation are all that we need in order to calculate z-scores for any possible number of drinks in a given week. So let's go back to our z-distribution or the standard normal distribution. Well, again, we know that we can calculate the z score by subtracting the mean and dividing by the standard deviation. So now what we can do is to say, OK, if somebody is drinking exactly the mean number of drinks reported, 4.8, we know they're going to get a z score of 0. And therefore, any number of drinks greater than 4.8 would be positive values for z. Any number of drinks less than 4.8 would co uh, constitute negative values of z and so forth and so on. And then what we can do is to use those z-scores because we already know our cutoffs on the z-distribution to do hypothesis testing, just like we could with the coin flip, coin flip example. So again, let's say that we want to know whether or not a certain number of drinks is more than the typical college student. So if we have the population of college students, and we want to call this typical, and then we want to know whether one specific value just like six coin flips or ten heads out of ten coin flips okay, was abnormal, if you will, or too many, unlikely to have come from this population of a fair coin, we can also say, is there a certain number of drinks that suggest that somebody is drinking much more than the typical college student? Okay? And in this case, remember what we're talking about are the typical infrequent binge drinkers across both genders in college students, or at least 1993 circa 1993 college students. Okay. And so that's very simple to do. So let's start with somebody. Okay. We know that our cutoff for saying that somebody is going to be drinking much more than is typical is going to be, again, this value of 1.65. Remember, that is because 1.65 is the value on the z distribution that puts 5% of the most extreme scores up there in that tail, okay, beyond the value of the cutoff. So then we can take any value for x and very simply and quickly calculate the z-score. Okay? If we start out with the z-score, okay, or uh, sorry, the number of drinks of 6. Let's say somebody drinks 6 drinks in a given week. Okay? Well, then it's very easy to calculate the z-score. We take 6 minus that mean of 4.8 divided by that standard deviation of 4.3. And we end up with a z-score of about 0 0.3, 0 0.28 in fact. That's indicated by the blue arrow here. And what you can see is this person is drinking right around in the middle of this distribution. So we can look at their actual value of 6 and see, yeah, they're a little bit greater than the mean of 4.8. And that's just what the blue arrow is showing us. They are above the zero or mean point of the standard normal distribution. But it doesn't seem to be an extreme amount. In other words, 6 drinks isn't one of the most extreme values that we would expect to find on this distribution. 
So if we meet somebody who drinks six drinks a week, then we would say, yeah, it's probably very likely that this person is an infrequent binge drinker because that's the population, remember, that we're looking at here. But what if you talk to somebody else and you find out that they're drinking 12 drinks in a given week? Well, just like the first person, we can very easily calculate this z-score. 12 minus 4.8 divided by 4.3. Now, when we do this calculation, we actually get a z-score of 1.67. That moves the blue arrow all the way up here and, in fact, into this rejection region or critical region. In other words, it's beyond our cutoff value. So now if you meet somebody that's drinking 12 drinks in a given week, you can say, well, actually, this person is either one of the most extreme infrequent binge drinkers that we found, if indeed our null hypothesis is true, that this person does, in fact, come from the distribution of infrequent binge drinkers or else you have to reject that null hypothesis, which is what we would do here, and we would say, listen, infrequent bid drinkers typically drink about 4.8 drinks a week. Now, not every single one of them drinks 4.8. That's why we have some variability, in particular a standard deviation of 4.3. But what we, what we see here is, okay, somebody who drinks 12 drinks in a given week, their z-score suggests that they are one of the most extreme infrequent binge drinkers and in particular we would take this as sufficient evidence to say it's unlikely this person's actually an infrequent binge drinker. We would reject the hypothesis that they come from this population and suggest that they probably come from a different population such as the population of frequent binge drinkers who as the data suggests drink a lot more in a given week. Okay. So this is how we can use z-scores to do hypothesis testing given just the mean and standard deviation of a distribution. Now critically when we're using z-scores to do hypothesis testing we are assuming a normal distribution because the values that we're using like the cutoff of 1.65 in particular are based off of the assumption of a normal distribution. So it could very well be that the distribution of number of drinks in a given week among college students is not perfectly normally distributed. So that could be a situation where the extent to which it's not normal, or at least not normally distributed, could affect the interpretation of our results as well. Now these are some things that we're going to want to consider and that we'll talk about over the course of the, of the semester and really any time we're conducting research. But hopefully this lecture so far has outlined the basics of hypothesis testing and done it in a way that it reviews what you did in 293 in sets, as I mentioned, a common foundation, in particular for the way that I'm describing these sorts of concepts and the way that I would like you guys to think about them moving forward. To quickly foreshadow where we're going next, hopefully if you guys are all comfortable doing this type of hypothesis testing using z-scores on a single score x, the next step is going to say, well, what if we don't want to look at a single person who drank six drinks or a single person who drank 12 weight drinks? What if instead you have a group of people and you want to know whether or not this group drinks significantly more. Maybe it's your fraternity. Maybe it's you and your three different roommates. Okay, so, so the people living in your house or whatever the case may be. You have a group of four people or 14 or 40 or however many people. And you want to know, as a group, do they seem to be drinking more than average? Or as a group, do they seem to be different than the population? Well, in this situation, we're not going to be dealing with just a single score x, but in fact, we're going to be dealing with a group mean. So in other words, what we're going to be looking at is instead of comparing a single score to the population, if we want to compare an entire group to the population, what we want to do is to look at the average number of drinks across people in the group. And is that going to change how we look at this logic of hypothesis testing? Well, that's exactly what we're going to encounter next. And what we're going to see is, even though the basic logic conceptually is the exact same, it is going to have some implications for exactly the formulas that we're using. And we're going to see that the same exact calculation doesn't quite hold. But hopefully you'll see how, again, conceptually and theoretically, we're actually performing the exact same set of steps. And that is, if our null hypothesis is true, what sorts of values do we expect to find? Then, once we set that up, we can say, okay, among all of these values that we expect to find, which of these values are we going to say, those, even though we might find them sometimes, those are too extreme. I'm going to call those too unlikely. 
That's the second step then, is setting off your cutoff for too unlikely. Finally then, after you collect your data, then you can see whether or not, given the data that you do have, you think that the sample is too unlikely to have come from that distribution under the null hypothesis, in which case then you would reject it and support your research hypothesis. So that's what we'll be doing, continuing uh, with class this semester. At this point, you should be prepared to take the lecture quiz that's posted online associated with the material in this lecture.